Okay. Hello. All right. Okay, so I did this presentation uh, in Argentina in November and it occurred to me I have the Spanish translation. So, you know, if you are, I'm assuming everyone here, you know, reads English, but just in case, I have a Spanish translation on my side, so that's kind of cool. But keep in mind, it was done by people in Argentina, so I think some things uh, translate maybe a little weird, but overall, yay, that's kind of awesome. Hello, I'm Tracy. Um, I will be, I mean, I'm sure the conference will as well, but I'll be uh, tweeting out the links to these slides after this presentation. So if you want the slides, um, I'm, my Twitter username is Lime Daring. It's often confused as Lime Darling. Everyone does it. It's totally okay. I do it sometimes myself. Um, but FYI, it's Lime Daring. All right, so a little bit about my um, background. I am a Californian that just moved to Canada. So I went from like completely opposite weather, which is kind of awful and wonderful at the same time. And my journey in programming really started with Wedding Lovely. It's a startup that I launched. I was a designer, taught myself how to code uh, Python. I started working on this startup, got some fundraising. Now I'm bootstrapping it. And then I took what I learned from that startup and I wrote these books called Hello Web App a couple of years ago. And it was writing these books that started the process of me thinking about writing and writing uh, uh, techno technical content and how can I write something that beginners understand but experts still enjoy. Uh, and a lot of these lessons I learned from Hello Web App and then building the, um, not just writing the books, but the GitHub repos and um, working with others kind of really taught me a lot about documentation and writing. So the thing with documentation, and it should say better documentation and writing, is that the better it is, the more users you have using whatever you've built. So documentation can be tutorials or your GitHub repos, um, your GitHub README, um, your actual documentation, walking, walking people through the pieces and parts of your project. So pretty much any technical writing. The better it is, the more users you'll have, and then hopefully less support requests, and then hopefully that will also lead to uh, more contributors. So writing is hard, and it's hard you know, to come here to developer conference and to be like, both of my talks, I'm doing one tomorrow on marketing for developers, both of these things relate to writing. And I'll tell you that I personally hated write, writing growing up. In high school and in university, writing was my least favorite subject. And yet here I am, like, if you told me 10 years ago I'd, I'd be, have two books out and working on a third, I would thought, you're absolutely insane, because I really, really, um, don't enjoy writing, but the benefits have, have definitely worked out in terms of bringing more people into programming and these kind of lessons apply to um, getting people more interested in you know, open source projects. And so if you're, even, if you're working as a developer, at some point you'll have to write. And you know, I'm doing a lot of talk on technical writing and technical content. Uh, most of these tips work for all writing. So even if you are writing, um, blog posts are not technical, you know, hopefully these tips will all translate. So by technical writing, I mean things like your, um, your docs, tutorials that are around a, a project, like this class tutorial, again, readmes, um, and then it can go on to like your about page of your home, you know, the about on your home page. If you have a landing page for your open source project, you're gonna have to do some sort of writing as well. So really, you cannot escape writing, even if you're a developer. Uh, and I'm going to just talk about content. I, have, I am terrible at spelling and grammar. I have people that have been very used to me going, please help this, help me, help my writing, fix this for me. I will not be talking about any sort of grammar or anything like that. I'm just going to talk about design, or excuse me, content, uh, and not about the layout and design of documentation either. So, in a nutshell, how do we make our content, technical writing, documentation easy to read and enjoyable? So, part one is creating friendly and welcoming writing. The main thing to remember here is that when you're writing, the person you're writing for is not yourself. 
you can fall into this trap of being like, do, 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 writing, 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 and imagining your other person um, having the same skills and having the same background information with you, as you, but you don't know where people are coming from when they find writing about your project, again, for documentation or your homepage or anything like that. Someone can have a vastly different uh, set of skills or a different background, and being aware of that and remembering that other people with different um, uh, backgrounds might be reading and writing will help you uh, write better just in general. The way, the easiest way to start writing for other people, writing a little bit more accessible, is to simply write like a human. Write like you're having a conversation with another human. And I like to write informally as well, because that also makes it easier for someone to, um, to uh, uh, read what I've written. So by informally, I mean this is Hello Web App, and I have things in here that you don't usually see in a programmer's book. Um, I have little woohoos. There's lots of really silly jokes. My my uh, my dedication um, is really ridiculous. I had it on here for a long time um, until I was like, no, it's kind of inappropriate. Talks about yeah. Anyways, um, I do, I write very informally, and this is one of the reasons I do that is so beginners will feel more comfortable with the work I've the writing I've done, but it's still fun for experts. But when you're writing informally, you might want to like be tempted to use jokes or um, use cultural references, and these kind of things might not translate. So calling out requests, maybe this changed since I took the screenshot. The very top line of request says, request is the only non-GMO HTTP library for Python safe for human consumption. How, like, if you're, you know, a beginner, you might be like, is this serious? Now, if you're translating this from a different language, if you're coming in um, not knowing English and using Google Translate, and it says safe for human consumption, and you're, that could be very confusing. And you can explain it, but as the very first line in an in a, um, open source project, maybe not the best idea. So, to create a conversation, to write like if you're, as if you're having a conversation with someone, best way to do it is to create a persona and review your writing like with that persona in mind. So, how would Fred, a designer working on his first programming project, um, need to know about my project? What would they need to know? Uh, would this be accessible to someone who has beginner knowledge in Python? Would this be accessible to someone with, mm, you know, intermediate knowledge in Python but is new to servers? You know, uh, to go back to requests because I felt kind of mean, um, they do a good job on this on the authentication page. Uh, this document, it's very informal and it's, it's really nice to read, I find. This document discusses various kinds of authentication with requests. Many web services require authentication and there are many different types. Below, we outline various forms of authentication available in requests from the simple to the complex. So this is like accessible to a beginner. This is very like good English. This is easy to understand. Um, it's very straightforward, but it's not dry. Uh, to Eurolib 3, it's actually my husband's project, so quick, I'm a little bit biased. Um, but I like what they did in their documentation in terms of like talking like a human to others. So it says, oops, sorry. Sorry, this is kind of small. I should have uploaded this. But basically it says, go to eurolib3.readadocs for more syntax highlighted examples, but long story short, here's an example here. You could say, hey, go over here and read the documentation, but having that little example in there makes it a little bit more accessible, a little more friendly. And then when you're also writing, remember that terms that are obvious to you might not be obvious to others. You know, if you have, again, if you're writing your project as an export level Pythoner, some things that you know about might not be known by someone who's a beginner reading your project. Best way to illustrate this is to go all the way over to cooking. I love to cook. I know all the terms related to cooking. But man, there are some weird terms used in recipes. Cream the butter. Trust the bird. Fold the egg white. Such weird verbs. Render the fat. Then my personal favorite, shock the vegetables. So if you don't know cooking, you might be looking at these going, what do you mean by shock the vegetables when there's a recipe that says shock the vegetables? And 
recipes are really inaccessible accessible to beginners because someone has to go and be like, what's shocking the vegetables? Oh, it's taking vegetables, boiling them, and then dipping them really quickly into ice cold water. Would you have gotten that from shock the vegetables? No. So back to programming. Uh, link to anything you don't want to explain. Like you can't, it's, you know, if you're again working on an advanced project and you're talking about things that are advanced level concepts, you don't want to have to go into depth for each one of these things um, because that would make it really hard to read if you're constantly explaining what you're talking about. So with Laravel, it says Laravel uses Composer to manage its dependencies and Composer is linked. Now if someone's reading this and Composer wasn't linked, the implication is that someone should already know what Composer is before using Laravel. But when it is linked to the beginner or someone who's not, you know, doesn't know Composer, it's basically saying, hey, you might not know what Composer is. Here's a link to tell you more. It's very easy to add links for concepts um, and for other projects. You don't have to explain them, but it kind of hands held someone, hand holds someone um, and tells them it's okay they don't know about this. Here's where you can learn more. So this is, this is a whole uh, blog post. It's talking about teaching, not telling. That kind of uh, goes over the concept of, you know, when someone says, I need help with this, and you say, oh, go read the docs. You know, go read the source code. Excuse me, you know, docs or thing. Go, go read the source code. The main thing to remember is to teach, not tell. To illustrate this, the son says, hey, dad, you said you're going to teach me how to drive after school today. Are we still going to do that? If you tell someone to go, you know, read the source, it's like saying, of course, this car is in the garage. I laid out a set of, set of wrenches on the workbench. Take the entire car apart, look at each piece, then put it back together. Reading the source code only works for someone who's already familiar with your project. The documentation, the writing you do about your project, the tutorials, the introductions, those are the pieces that, need, that will help someone get to that level to be able to read the source code. That's why it's so important to have that friendly introduction. So you can't just say, go read the source to find out how this works. So the Django REST framework, I think, does this really well. Whoops. Uh, it says, in the quick start, it even has the steps where it says, uh, make a directory for your tutorial, CD into your tutorial, make a virtual environment, activate the virtual environment, install Django, install Django REST framework. And that's the first time you start working with Django REST framework. It kind of goes through that entire beginner part for making a project. It doesn't make those assumptions. To an advanced person coming here, they're like, oh, I already know all this. But they can just skip that. But for a beginner, this kind of handheld that get, um, helps them along to start this project by starting from the very beginning. Uh, dumb things down without making them dumb. Uh, that's really like just breaking your words down in a way, being very simple um, in your writing and in your exp explanations. And don't talk down to someone, but just make it super simple. Fabric has a really good um, introduction. The first paragraph, which you probably can't read, the first paragraph says, you know, what Fabric is, library and command line tool for streamlining the use of SSH. Second paragraph is, provides a basic suite of operations, so what it does, so what it is, what it does, and then the third paragraph is typical use. This is a very clean and succinct intro. Again, works really well for beginners trying to read um, what's going on here, but it doesn't, isn't talking down to them, and it's still accessible, accessible to experts. And then it goes straight into a very easy um, example, and then um, another example. Now, for the true breaking things down, Stripe's documentation is kind of amazing. So when I was researching this talk, I go on the Stripe, the Stripe documentation page. And if you go here, it starts animating. Let's see if that works. So it starts animating. And you can press the submit button, and it says success. And it says, copy paste this into your terminal. And I'm like, uh, OK. So I very quickly recorded this. Paste into my terminal. There's the response. Without doing anything, the web page updates and says, OK, now paste this in. It's like, OK, I'll paste that in. 
get another request, paste another thing in, and you can see it's going through those steps at the top. And at the very end, it says, success, you just created your first customer, your first charge, your first plan, and subscription, and you didn't have to do any sort of coding. That is like the true dumbing things down, where Stripe's documentation literally lets you play around with their API without typing a code. It just walks you through copying and pasting things into your terminal. Kind of amazing. Quick side note, use gender neutral language. Um, I work in startups. It's a lot, the Python and Django community is really awesome, but I am uh, a chick. I am a woman. It's been really awesome to work in these communities. However, in startups, 99.9% .9 of the people in startups are, and founders are dudes. And when someone is writing for startups, they say, the founder does this and then he does this, it is very noticeable um, to me because I'm working so hard to feel like I'm a part of the startup community um, to be you know, a startup founder myself and to see people assuming all startup uh, founders are men really sucks. So thanks for the uh, programming community. Um, people have been working on this uh, really wonderfully. You know, avoid gendered pronouns is also good because you can get into this giant fight on your GitHub repo, this is a while ago, um, but it went on four pages of people yelling at each other. So it's also good for avoiding controversy. Try to avoid pronouns um, when you're doing your writing. Try not to do any assumptions about the gender of the person writing it. Uh, this resource, which I'll tweet out, is, is simple. It says, here's an example sentence, and here's how you can rewrite it. And it is so awesome. So if you're unsure about how to avoid gender, um, gendered proton, gender and pronouns, um, just read this, and I'm sure, I guarantee you, you'll find an a, uh, example that'll help you out. All right, that's a lot of, of writing is such a huge topic. You know, it all depends on what you're writing. And you could be writing and be like, I don't know if this is working. Uh, it might be feel very overwhelmed if you're not used to writing yourself. So quick reminder, take a break. I find that doing some writing, taking a break, and coming back to it later, I'll feel better about what I've written or find the issues I had. And then take advantage of your friends you have around you, because people often are very happy to help out. So just having someone review what you re you've written will find issues in terms of formality and friendliness, and then also grammar and spelling. All right, second part, a little bit about writing clearly. So just a little bit about content and how to write content that's easier to read. Good rule of thumb is when you're writing, try to use only two to three sentences per paragraph. People on the web skim. So if you're writing a tutorial and you find your paragraphs are getting line, 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 before breaking into another paragraph, it's very likely that someone's not going to read that, they're just going to move on. Uh, cutting it down, cutting down your paragraphs and simplifying your content will mean more people will be interested in reading what you've written. So simplify your language. Is there a more direct way to say the same thing? So, you know, this says, the original it is very important to note that you need to be careful when modifying your source code. Could very much more simply be put, be careful when modifying your source code. Now, if you can't simplify your content and make it shorter, so your paragraphs are shorter, you can, you know, my favorite tactic is to break something into bullets, because that's usually long paragraphs or you're going, you're, it's because you're going through a lot of different items. And I also like to use italics and bolding to help people who are skimming to see the important parts of a paragraph and they can just land and uh, read further if they need to when they're skimming. So another example in terms of simplicity, please note that although Chrome is supported for Mac and Windows operating systems, it is recommended all users of the site switch to the most up-to-date version of the Firefox web browser for best possible results. That is technically correct, it is very wordy. For best results, use the latest version of Firefox. Chrome for Mac and Windows is also supported. Says the same thing, it is shorter. Don't read these, but you can see the point behind it. The left is gonna be really hard to read. It is one giant paragraph. But by splitting into bullets, for someone who's skimming, they can go between the bullets. It kind of gives their eye a place to land and then read further. But you can improve readability by adding that bolding that I mentioned before that bolds important parts of this paragraph. 
and then further improve readability by adding some spacing if you can do so. All right, don't forget your headlines. Um, headlines are really, really important in writing in general, and it applies for pretty much all writing. When there's headlines breaking up the content, again, working with people who are skimming your content um, gives them a place to land. Someone who is on the Stripe documentation can skim through here until they find the saving credit card details for later. Very important headline, introduces the next section, breaks up the giant monotonous paragraphs that are on this page. Um, this blog post, which is also about writing in plain language, headlines in between these paragraphs to introduce those paragraphs. Uh, use headlines as much as possible makes your content easier to read and skim. All of these tips for simplicity, making things shorter, um, making things easier to read, will help people who are translating your docs as well, or translating what you've written. You know, whether using Google Translate here or using uh, Translate that's within Chrome or whatnot. Uh, the simpler, easier to read uh, what you've written is, the easier it will be to translate into other languages. And then moving away from text and content, document with pictures. If you're working with technical content, having images and visual content will totally way help someone who is trying to go through your content and help them understand what to do. So for example, um, in this documentation, it says, hey, you should see output like this. And they have a big red circle around, the, uh, around what they want you to see. They, someone can read this. But having an image here helps someone understand exactly what you're referring to. Same thing here. This documentation has a um, question, how do you add a chapter to a manual? And has this image, I mean, it says up there, click on the manual gear and, and select create chapter. And then they have an image with a big arrow pointing to the gear and then a big red box around the create chapter. Here's the Shopify um, documentation where it says, uh, Point three, create a new store. And it has this image in here showing you what the create store looks, the button looks like on the page. So if someone's more of a visual thinker, they can read your, your documentation, see that image, and then later when they're looking at the project, they'll be able to see like, a lot quicker what you're talking about. And then Shopify goes one step further um, and even has little um, animated GIFs. Because it says, hey, from your Shopify admin, click on settings, then click on sales channels. And on this little GIF, shows someone going through, go back, going through, clicking that gear, and clicking on the sales channel button. Adding images and GIFs and whatnot, um, if you're trying to describe how to do something in your, your technical writing or documentation, images um, don't decrease from the content. They can only add and make things easier to understand. So in conclusion, that's a lot of like really general tips. Um, things to remember going forward. Remember that your readers have different backgrounds and experiences from you. Uh, if you're writing advanced content, you might be tempted to say, oh, only people from you know same advanced content background as me uh, would be reading this anyway, so I don't need to dumb it down. But you don't know, like someone could be advanced in one area, beginner in another area. They might land on your project. And if you can write in a way that's good for beginners or people from different backgrounds, that doesn't you know, for people who do have the background you're looking for, uh, they can still read your content, but so can those beginners. Be friendly and write like a human. Like your writing would be more accessible and easier and more fun to read if it's if it sounds like you're a human, not just someone who's going through and documenting something technical. Uh, you know, computer science tech books, textbooks can be really boring and dry. And let's try to avoid that when we're writing content for our own projects. Uh, in general, simplify. Simplify, simplify uh, the length of your, what you've written. Um, cut it down and make it easier uh, to read. Simplify your word choice and complex. Um, the complexity of the words that you're choosing. Uh, simplify your layout. Again, I, we don't really talk about the design, but simplify applies to everything. Uh, all these tips that I put into this presentation, I've actually 
written them up into a article. So if you're interested in this, this is going to be them. Um, it's on Medium. I'll link out those slides, but it's pretty much everything I said, but in written format. Otherwise, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, questions. Hit me. Yes. I know. Well, obviously, I think from the very beginning. Well, I mean, like, when you create a Gates. Yeah. It's funny when you make the GitHub repo, GitHub's like, here's your readme. Like, hint, hint, put your readme in in the very beginning. Um, obviously, I'm the opinion of as early as possible. Um, if you're working on something and it's not launched yet, um, having some documentation at least talking about what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve could bring more people to work with you. Um, it is only a net benefit, I find, to writing at least a little bit. And hopefully it doesn't take that much time as well. It's not like you have to write a book about your project. You just have to write supporting documentation around your project. Yes? Uh, so you were talking about uh, gender-neutral yeah. um, Do you have any That's a good question. Um, it's hard because that link, I found it, and I'm like, this is the one. Um, <laughs> so I, didn't, I can't think of anything off top, uh, offhand right now. I also know um, that it depends on language as well. This is very much an English thing. I know that different languages have um, different requirements, and I can't speak very well about how it applies to other languages. Um, I'm sure there's more, though, uh, because it's such a huge topic. So, I mean, if you ping me later, I can, help, I can see about finding some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, question about uh, translations. <laughs> uh, does it make sense for open source uh, projects? Because the uh, community has no resource to keep it, uh, the documentation up to date. And uh, I don't think if uh, outdated documentation makes sense. Uh, well, when I was speaking about translations, I was thinking about the user translating documents that you've written. Um, so then, because, you know, someone might be coming to your project from Japan and might be using translations. Uh, do you mean, so translation, doc, like official translations in your documents? Well, like the translation of uh, part of the documentation, general documentation, all over Yeah, like official ones where it says here's the Spanish one, here's the Portuguese one. Um, yeah, it does make it hard. Uh, I think that, like large projects would find that beneficial to support those, even though it does take time to go through and like retranslate things when things change. Um, I would hope that the benefits outweigh the negatives, because by having those additional translation docs, then um, you know taking the extra time to update them. But overall, they have more users and more people who are using their projects. So uh, I'm obviously a big fan of documentation. So I you know, recommend doing that, but a smaller project probably doesn't need to um, spend the time doing that, but large projects I think definitely should and continue to keep those up to, up to date. Cool. One minute left. Or you can go eat snacks. I don't know. <laughs> everyone in favor of snacks. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Thank you.